All right, let's get started. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Pro uh, Professor Eric Sutter. He's uh, one of our associate professors, and he joined us actually very recently. Uh, Eric got his bachelor degree from UCSD with great honors, and then he got his master's and PhD from uh, MIT. Uh, his research interests are probabilistic graphical models, non-parametric Bayesian methods, and uh, applications of statistical machine learning and computer vision. He's won many awards, including the NSF Career Award and also the uh, ISBA Mitchell Prize. And he's also named one of the AIs uh, that tend to watch. All right, uh, so let's uh, welcome uh, Eric and Eric, please. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, so today I'm going to tell you about some work I've been doing on uh, sort of inference and high dimensional graphical models. You think about the statistical inference problems that have high dimensional complex structure. I want to particularly highlight the contributions of Jason Pacheco. This was uh, a lot of the work he did for his PhD thesis at Brown University. That's where I was a faculty member before I joined UC Irvine. And he's now a postdoc at MIT. Um, okay, so very high level of high dimensional inference problem. We have some data, like an image. And we have some unknowns, I'll call them x in this talk. And we have some probability model that says how x and y relate to each other. And of course, statistics and machine learning are all about building probability models. But for complicated things, we actually, even if we know the probabilities, we have a problem of estimation of saying, now given this image, what is the x, what is the sort of model that best aligns with it? Okay? And if my things I don't know are all discrete variables, there's sort of finite number of possibilities, then there's a big literature on essentially adapting tools from combinatorial optimization to do this. Okay? Um, but when we have more continuous variables, as you can think about the range of possible poses of a person in the world, not to speak about the shapes of the body and so forth, is kind of a more continuous space of variation, then there's not really efficient general solutions. And this sort of workhorse of continuous optimization, which is sort of gradient-based methods that start with a solution and try to go uphill, tend to be just hopelessly bad for these problems. Um, in optimization terms, it's because they're highly, highly non-convex. Um, and so I'm going to talk about a range of, we've worked on a range of continuous inference problems from sort of human pose estimation and tracking of videos to protein structure and side chain prediction uh, to some things in uh, sort of motion planning for robotics and vehicles. Um, in the interest of time, I'm actually not going to talk about this last one and focus on these first two applications in this talk. But I'm interested in machinery that is general purpose that would apply to all of these as well as a huge range of other potential applications. Okay. And the specific entrance, inference problem is that we're going to be focusing on is what's called maximum a posteriori or map estimation. So it's a posteriori because we have data and we're interested in the posterior distribution of, of our model given data and maximum because we're finding the max. So we're finding essentially a mode of the posterior, the most likely solution. And so sort of conceptually, if I had a model of people, then finding the map in for estimate would be somewhat like saying that, say, locating the locations of all the limbs of this person in this image. Okay? Um, but we're not just only interested in the maps. We're also, if I have a posterior that's multimodal, we'd also like to identify secondary modes. Our models are approximate, so often this is useful to us to characterize uncertainty. And so often the secondary modes are interesting, like in this case there might be a secondary mode which corresponds to this other person. So we'd like to find all of those. And so we've developed map inference algorithms for continuous models that are widely applicable to any pairwise graphical model. I'll say what that means in a moment. Even if the model is, is very complex, highly non-Gaussian, they're black box. So this is in the sense that you give me a probability model, all I have to be able to do is call a function that evaluates probabilities. I don't have to have like a detailed functional form for your model, analytic gradients and that kind of thing. And this is often, uh, you know, useful in practice because, so for example, I have a complicated function re saying how good my model fits an image, it may be hard for me to do a manual analysis of it. And we're finally going to try to find things that will reliably infer multiple local optima. Okay. So, uh, a graphical model gets its name because it's based on a graph. And so in this graph, the nodes are the random variables I care about. So there's a, so you imagine if I had a graphical model of a person, I might have a node for each of its limbs, for its torso, the head, the upper arm, and lower arm, and so forth. 
And then there's a variable in each of those things, which for a person would be like the pose of that limb. Maybe it's also something about its shape. And then the edges encode relationships between them. Right? So you might have something saying about my upper arm and lower arm are constrained because they're connected by my elbow joint. Um, and then there'd be corresponding more complicated graph for something about talking about energetic interactions and proteins. Okay. And so if my graph is a tree, it has no cycles. So for example, a simple model of a person is a tree because your kinematic structure of your body is as a tree. Then I can get the global map estimate the by, by a sort of efficient algorithm that's basically dynamic programming. Okay? And so imagine I wanted to find the best value of this node x1. Well, I could say that's I need to maximize over all possible values of x1, x2, x3, and x4. Okay? And so I could do that just by a big list, but of course, if I have many possibilities for these things and, and a large number of nodes, that's kind of an exponentially large list of combinations. So I can't do that. But what you can do instead is use the <coughs> distributive law to say if I want to maximize all these things from the graph structure, I can say, ah, well, first I'll maximize over x4. I only have one term in my objective that depends on x4. And that's going to give me a function of x2 that's called a message. And then I can maximize over x3. I only have one term in my objective that it involves x3. That'll give me another message. And then given those, I can now solve a maximization over x2. Okay? Um, and, and solve that. And so on and so forth until I get the global optimum. And so just like for those who have seen dynamic programming like the Viterbi algorithm for over time, you can also optimize over trees. And with computational cost, that's linear rather than exponential in the size of the tree. So that's a very nice thing. Okay. Okay. So, so more formally, we are using these message passing in the trees, and in these messages, we can compute something that's called a max marginal. Um, and so, you probably all know what a normal marginalization is. A normal marginal is where you integrate over or sum over all the variables in the graph. A max marginal is similar, but what you do is you say, I'm going to pin one of my variables down to a value, and then I'm going to maximize over all others. So you could say, suppose I, I want to know if there's a person here. What's the probability of the best configuration of all the limbs of the person that's consistent with their head being here? That's what the max marginal would be. We're interested in max marginals because they directly encode the global map, but also they give me these secondary modes. So let me pick off multiple hypotheses. Now let me talk in a little more detail about uh, a model I'm going to use as a running example of this model for articulated pose estimation. And so in this model, the state of each of my variables is going to be this continuous thing that has, it's about a 10-dimensional thing that's going to encode the shape of, of the limb, because there's variability across shape for different people, the orientation of it, um, and the position of it, and so on and so forth. Okay? And so I'll have a complicated likelihood function relating these to images that I used some previous machine learning to, to specify, as well as sort of potentials that talk about you know, what is the relationships between upper and lower limbs that, again, I'm going to use previous machine learning to use. So this is an old family of models. It's sometimes called an uh, arti the, uh, articulated structure. It goes way back. There's a lovely paper uh, from 1973 by Fischler and Elschlager, which they said, if I want to find uh, they were sort of thinking about trying to localize parts of objects and images. So in this case, they have a little sort of spring-based model of the parts of a face and how they relate to each other. And they said, I'm going to try to match up that to an image by minimizing an energy. Okay? So minimizing energy is kind of the same thing as maximizing the probability. Okay? Um, and, and so back then, uh, Times were tough. We didn't, they didn't have real displays, so they had to use this ASCII pseudo, pseudo art to display their results. So, right, so here's an image of a person that they had no way to construction and so on. Um, and so that was early 70s. Um, uh, fast forward about three decades, and you have models that, that look kind of like this. So they have these sometimes sort of very rigid rectangular models of people. So you model each limb by this kind of rectangle. And now you kind of say, where should I put the rectangles to overlap with the person in the image? Uh, you know, these are pretty simple images in terms of their background. Um, but we like more complicated models of people, right? So more, more recently, we've, we have data sets like 
data sets that have thousands and thousands of detailed three-dimensional laser scans of people. And from this, I can learn this very rich model, this kind of this work that started in the computer graphics world and transitioned more into computer vision, of how the three-dimensional shape of a human body varies as you vary its pose, as well as what are the variations in shape across the population of people, as you vary gender uh, and, and other parts of the upper. Okay? And now given that, I can learn a much more rich model of, of people in which I sort of use this three-dimensional model to calibrate a, a model of what two-dimensional people are going to look like viewed in realistic ways from lots of different cameras. So now I have this much richer model that hopefully <laughs> will not only let me uh, do a better job of estimating pose, but also estimate pose in a richer way. I can tell more than just you know, the elbows here. I can tell something about what the size and shape of the limbs are and so on in the image. There's lots of applications where that'd be nice to know. Okay. So again, so I'm going to have this model where in order to encode all this range of variation, you kind of have a high dimensional thing where it's not just the 2D position and orientation, but it's something saying more about the shape and sort of distance from the camera and so on and so forth. So you have more numbers to specify what's going on. Good. Okay, so I have a model and I have a tree structure graph and so I'll just run that belief propagation thing and get my result. Well, no. So to run that dynamic programming algorithm, you have to say, what are the messages? What are the things I'm passing around? And if all my variables are discrete, so you can think about I have, I'm just modeling the position of limbs, and I just have this list of like how many pixels there are in the images. The messages are vectors. You can think of there being like a probability of each location. Okay? And then the message updates is essentially sort of like matrix vector multiplication and discrete maximization. So it's something that roughly has cost quadratic in the number of discrete states. So as long as that number is not enormous, you can do it. Um, but if I have continuous models, um, uh, and, right? These messages, they're, they're actually functions. They're functions over the continuous space, like the, of the range of possible locations and shapes of a part of the body. And they have no analytic form, right, unless you make very unrealistic assumptions. Uh, and so you have this kind of complicated nonlinear optimization problem. And you might say, oh, well, I'll just discretize. And you could imagine discretizing, right? This is like saying, oh, I have a range of head locations, a range of arms, lower arms, and so on, just enumerate. And the problem is, is that unless you make your model very simple, you can't do that. So in this deformable structures model, you have about 10 dimensions to describe everything about position, orientation, shape, and so on. Even if you only took 10 grid points per dimension, dimension so 10 possible location, 10 possible horizontal positions and vertical location, which is way too small. But if you did that, you would have 10 to the 10th or 10 million states. Then for a pair of parts, you have 10 million squared combinations. So we can't do that, right? Especially, you know, maybe, maybe a supercomputer could do it, but we don't want to run a supercomputer to like analyze you know, one image localized objects. So this is going to be infeasible for high dimensional models that we care about. For those of you who have a little background in, in computer vision and machine learning, you may there was one of the sort of classic methods is what's called a particle filter. This is a method that sort of does tracking of a whole body pose by sort of starting with a set of hypotheses. And then you have a dynamics model that says, well, from one video frame to the next, the person can only move so much. So you make guesses as to sort of where the limbs have moved from one frame to the next. And then you evaluate those with respect to the image, right? So you sort of check your guesses and you resample. And so that's why you have a lot of things, but then some of these particles don't really line up with the image, so you resample. And you make more guesses and you resample and so on. So you do this over time. And well, you start off okay, but as this is a real run of a particle filter, as you run it over time, you eventually tend to get to situations like this, where there's a person here and then you have this guess and the model is sort of all its resources are on this terrible solution. And you get this degeneracy over time. And this is a real problem with these sort of classic stochastic sampling methods. Um, the reason is that for the particle filter, each particle is a full joint instantiation of the model. So one particle sa says the person is like this. Another particle says, well, they're to the right, and their arms have changed like this. And if you think about all the places you could put a person and all the ways they could move their arm, the number of combinations is explosively enormous. And so, and so you say, if I have literally, you know, 
uh, thousands of trillions of ways you can like, ha have a person in an image, and I try to like track that with a, a thousand particles, a thousand guesses, you just can't fill up that space. For our, our, for our particle-based inference algorithms I'm going to talk about today, we're doing something different. Each particle is a single variable mode. So I have particles that are head locations, particles that are <laughs> body locations, particles that are upper arm locations, and so on. And then I say I'm going to think about all combinations of these particles, all ways of piecing them together into whole bodies. And what's nice is I can do that efficiently and implicitly using optimization algorithms. Okay. So here's the idea. I have this particle max product in which I'm going to have a set of particles. I'm going to sort of guess more hypotheses. I'm going to do my max product updates to see how good they are, and then select particles. Okay? Right. So you have this guessing stage in which I make new guesses. So you sort of throw down particles, okay? and you say, some of, some of them will be good. They'll line up with real parts of the body. Some of them will be bad, because okay? you haven't checked everywhere in the image yet. Then you run this max product message passing algorithm. And it's tractable to do, because now what am I, I'm not optimizing over the full continuous space. I'm optimizing <coughs> over my current particle set. So I won't find the best thing possible in the world, but I can find the best thing out of all my particles efficiently. Okay. And then finally, you have this selection step. So I want to run this many times, you know, sort of optimize particles, uh, find the best, then guess more particles, optimize the best. But the problem is that optimization is quadratic in the number of particles. So you can't just keep growing and growing in the particle set because computation gets out of control. So at some point, you have to do selection, where you say, some of my bad, worst hypotheses, I'll throw them away. I'll forget about them so they don't slow me down. The particle, classic particle filter does this uh, by stochastic resampling, just basically randomly choosing particles proportional to their probability. And this is something you can prove has good properties in the limit as the number of particles goes to infinity. Uh, so that's lovely. But we don't live in asymptopia. And uh, when you only have 1,000 particles in a huge space, the variance of that resampling step is huge. And that's why, in practice, these methods perform very poorly. So we need a better way to choose particles. So I'm going to look at a toy example to illustrate some of what we're doing. Um, so uh, this was some work that appeared on the, at the International Conference on Machine Learning, ICML. So we made this nice image where we have our people spelling out ICML for us. And uh, so we have this kind of simplified thing where basically the likelihood says find poses in which the edges of the body line up with the, the edges of these silhouettes. And so we're going to initialize, scatter body parts everywhere. All right, and now our goal is, is that our inference algorithm, if it works well, it should localize these four people. It should say that there's four modes my posterior corresponding to these four people. And it should also reliably find the global map, which in this case, the map is the M, because that's kind of a, the most typical pose here of a person. The others are kind of more strange poses. So. As baselines, right? So one baseline it was a sort of greedy particle-based method where you uh, you might try where you basically you have your current map, you discard all your other hypotheses, and you kind of you sample a cloud of particles around your current best guess, then you optimize to get a new best guess, then sample a new cloud and repeat. So it's kind of just kind of greedy search. Um, this is multiple runs of that greedy search of the particles you get, and so basically you just kind of get a cloud of particles in a random location. And what you get is kind of just depends on where you started. Okay, so it doesn't work terribly well. Uh, another version is what's all called top mode particle max product. These are things from prior work in the literature, where you propose new particles in a smart way. I won't go into. And then you basically say, suppose I have 200 current particles, and I want to reduce down to 100. What I do is just I sort the probabilities from highest to lowest, easy to sort. And then I just take the top of the list. The problem is, is all this kind of, at one level, it kind of puts the particles in the high, high probability parts of the space. You look what happens. I have a bunch of particles that are all kind of tiny variations on each other. Right, so here you can say that I've got a bunch of like lower arms that are all, they're distinct, but they're almost exactly the same. Because they're just epsilon apart probability. And then if I run it a second time, I get the same thing except I get a different person. So with different runs, I'll randomly get different people, different parts of the space. 
Well, that's not so good. So instead, we're going to look at a different way of doing our selection, where if I have a set of particles, I want to reduce them down. We're going to set up an optimization problem, which says find the set of particles that provably minimize the distortion in your current approximation. And this is going to automatically sort of spread our particles, in this case our torso particles, around the space in which we cover the best particles and also kind of don't just put them all in one person, but spread them around. Um, this is just uh, showing that the optimization works well. I'm not going to go into that now. Okay. All right. So to give you intuition for this particle selection problem, um, uh, let me look at uh, a sort of very toy problem. So, uh, the simplest graphical model is one which is just two variables. So I have two one-dimensional variables, S and T, and uh, so I have one edge between them. And so this is my joint distribution, the thing I want to find the modes of. Right, so in this case, it's a mixture of two Gaussians, so there's kind of two bumps here. This bump right here is the global mo mode, and there's a secondary mode over here in this bump. So that's what you'd like your algorithm to find, is realize that, oh, okay, well there's a peak here and a peak here. And if you truly computed a you know, message over this continuous space, which I can do approximate here by just doing a very fine discretization, this is what you get. So this is sort of the message that node t would send to node s, which is you can think of as taking this function and maximizing along one dimension. So you get this kind of max of two bumps. <laughs> Now if I have a set of particles, so in this case to illustrate, I'll assume my particles live on a regular grid, I would instead of, if you say, if I had a continuous message, I'm instead going to get this discrete approximation to it. Okay? And so I have this approximation with all these particles, but now the question is what, you know, what happens if I, I can't afford 50 particles? I have to just throw a few down. Okay? Well, if you put one particle here, you would get this green approximation. So having a particle here sort of representing this state of node s kind of approximates one mode but ignores the other. But then if you said, well, let me do two particles. Let me be smart. I'll put the second particle on the second mode. If I just had two particles, I can already get this very good approximation of what the distribution is. Because somehow I'm sort of capturing the key things that are going on by sort of saying, well, the, the really the most plausible configuration for xs are this one and this one. Okay. So we're going to set up a, uh, to have, so alpha is the, so your alpha n is like 200, n is like 100. So I have 200 current particles, and I want to approximate it with 100 particles. And I want to do it such that I minimize the distortion between messages. So you could say that there's a green message and a blue message. And that, to the extent that they differ, that's going to be an error. I'm going to sum up my errors. Okay? So classic optimization problem. Now note, not trivial, right? If I, ha if I want to pick, if I have 200 things, I want to pick 100 of them. That's 200 choose 100 combinations, right? So that's exponentially big. And it's uh, uh, NP-hard to, to find the optimum. So we typically take that as bad news in computer science. Uh, but the good news is that it's submodular, uh, which means that uh, we're in shape. So what is submodularity? So mod submodularity is a property of discrete optimization problems. So if I'm optimizing over a set function, so right, I want to pick a subset of particles. So I'm picking, I'm sort of choosing a subset of things. Um, submodularity means you have diminishing marginal gain. So this says I want to maximize something. And I say, suppose I have, I'm going to consider adding one new element to my set, one new particle. The gain from adding that, two, that new element to a small set has to be bigger than the gain from adding that element to a big set. <coughs> so what, is this, what does this mean intuitively here? It says, if I want to, uh, I'm choosing particles to approximate my posterior, I get the most benefit from a particle if it's all by itself. And then if I, instead, I have a part of the space where I already have a few particles, I put another one right next to them, I'm going to get less benefit. Provably. Okay. And what's great about these sort of submodular maximization functions is if you just do the, the, the dumbest algorithm you could think of, which is a greedy one, which you say, I had this objective, 
Take the part, pick the single particle that reduces it the most. Now take your second one and reduce it as most, and so on. So just greedy. That's probably almost optimal. So you get within 63% of the optimal solution. And in our case, since we're just picking sets, this is, gives us a small amount of overhead that is uh, no problem in practice. Okay. So how would this greedy algorithm that's probably close to optimal works? It would say, okay, you figure out your maximum of the margin. So this is basically in my if I my current approximation of this blue message, where is the biggest error? And that's right here. And then now you pick the particle that reduces that error as much as possible. So I pick one particle and I knock down, I approximate that mode and I do that. And now I say, oh, now given that I've selected that one particle, where is my next biggest error? And it turns out it's right here. So you put a particle <laughs> on this next mode and so on. And now you say, given I've done that, where is my next biggest error? And you put a particle on this next mode and so on and so forth. So here, what I'm showing is that here, even though I started with 50 particles, if I cleverly pick three of them, which our algorithm can do automatically, you get a very good approximation. Mm. And so if I go back to that toy problem, this is what I get if I run it multiple times on that data. And so reliably, every single time, I get particles covering all the people and all their parts, and something's going to Okay? And so I find the map <coughs> every time. Um, here's a way of quantifying that. This is uh, these are box plots across 10 random initializations of, if you look at left, this is errors. And um, so these are what standard algorithms are. You see this huge spread in error, where some runs you get a great answer, and some runs you get garbage, right? And so a lot of these park algorithms have traditionally been this way, and so thus they have this property that if an expert wants to use them to make a figure for her paper, <coughs> there's no problem. You just run it until you get it working. But if you give them to someone else and you want to use it in a real application where you care that this thing works over and over and you're not an expert, they're basically unusable. <coughs> On the other hand, if you go, these are two variants of our algorithm, you uh, see these box plots essentially with every single one, you get very low probability, sorry, very low error. This is uh, log probability, so higher is better, and across all the runs you rely, you get very little variability, the probability of the best solution you find. Yes. Quick question. Could you go back two slides uh, on, the, on the formula with the, the well, yeah, this one. Can you uh, uh, comment again why blue message MTS, the true message is available to you quickly? I, I lost track of this a little bit. Because mm. uh, that requires, right, this optimization requires computing. So the, the um, um, this continuous thing? Well, in the formula. It is not known. We don't know that. In the formula, you need MTS. So the M is, uh, the M is, the M in the formula, it's this blue histogram. So this is the message on my current particle set. So the idea is I have a, so the true continuous optimization, I don't know. Right. So what, what we're proving in this particle selection is particle filters always have this step where you, you, uh, you guess new particles and you get better, closer to the true continuous optimization, and then you select particles and you throw things away and you lose something. And so what we're, what we're doing is we're saying by doing this optimization instead of stochastic rep sampling, we're going to guarantee that when you discard some hypotheses, you lose almost nothing. Okay, got, got you. Thank you. Yeah. But there's still this question of what is the gap between this and this, right. and then that's, not, we're not, that's, that's, where, that's why you do multiple iterations of this to allow the stochastic proposals to close that gap. Thank Did you. that make sense? Yeah. Good. And now, um, looking at real images, um, so there's a, a standard data set where people have been labeled. Uh, it's all images from the, 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 the famous Buffy the Vampire Slayer TV show. Um, and here, this is uh, uh, detections. So you can think of this as basically the fraction of time I get close to the true estimate of a, of a body part. And so, um, um, what these are showing here is that we're doing, uh, by doing diverse selection, we do quite a bit better than the standard greedy algorithms on the same model, and also we're, we're uh, performing some previous models uh, that uh, sort of also aim to try to do diversity. Um, if we look at multiple people, here's sort of example runs where this is the particles we get on these images, and these are sort of modes that you pick out from those particles. So you can see that you're covering both of the people with two different modes. Um, 
And you can quantify sort of how well you do at detecting multiple people with a precision recall curve. This is roughly saying, you know, for different detection thresholds, sort of how much you want to trust to make a prediction, you can say how precise am I, what fraction of my predictions are correct, and also how many of the people am I finding. And so this light blue curve is a standard kind of greedy method where it's very precise but has low recall. So you find a small subset of the people accurately, but most you miss. And this black curve is our method. You can see that there's this much bigger tail where you sort of like get find, you know, instead of only finding about 45% of the people, you find over 80% of the people to high accuracy. Um, uh, some collaborators and sort of independent work building on the things I did uh, had looked at also applying this to, to three dimensional data. So I have this three dimensional model of people and I have one of these laser scans. And, and so I have sort of mesh data and now I want to do the alignment of this. And you can take exactly the same algorithm in this three dimensional space. So you have body parts in 3D, you start doing inference, refining them and so on and so forth. And eventually you get this sort of tight alignment of this model to this mesh which has no structure. Um, and there's all sorts of cool applications in graphics and special effects and so on and so forth that build on being able to do this kind of alignment. Okay. Now, um, now I want to move into talking about instead of estimating pose and single images to tracking poses of people over time, we're going to use a generalization of the model I talked about before. So I don't want to go through the details. There's, we have, you know, models of motion models and likelihood models of how parts relate to images and so on and so forth. It's all pretty standard. I'm going to skip the details. At a high level, right, but now you can think about since it's over time, now I basically have a copy of the person, like many copies of the person, where they are at frame one, two, three, four, five. And now I have a tree within each time point, which says kind of the constraints on the person at that time, but also edges over time. And those are encoding the fact that you know, in one thirtieth of a second, a person can only move their arm so fast when they move their head so much and so on, okay? So, because of these temporal edges, I now have a graph that's not a tree, it has many cycles. So, the classic way to apply sort of max product optimization uh, to graphical cycles is just uh, pretend you didn't really learn much about optimization and run the same algorithm anyway. This is called loopy max product. So you have a graph with cycles and you say I have all these message equations and I'll just start running them. Message, 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 message. Just run them in the cycle, hope for the best. Uh, this seems like a terrible idea. What's cool is that there was a decade of research showing that it actually is a great idea. And in fact, the state of the art decoding algorithms for error correcting codes that are today used in cell phone and satellite communication are based on exactly running this loopy max product algorithm in a particular graphical model, representing the structure of the code. <coughs> However, error correcting codes are very special, and for other graphs, like the ones I'm going to work on here, this can have fairly poor properties. But nevertheless, we can think about bringing in other tools from optimization theory. And I'm going to kind of go through this bit quickly, but um, basically what we can think about is if I have a graph with cycles, I can cover the graph by a mixture of trees, right? There's many spanning trees in any graph with cycles. So if I have some convex combination of spanning trees, it turns out you can use the distributions over trees to sort of get upper bounds on the true log probability. So if I think about the sort of optimization over each tree, uh, that I can do tractably. And it turns out if you take combinations of these tree optimizations, you can show that that upper bounds the true optimization solution. You, why is it upper bound? Essentially, if I take trees instead of a compute graph, I'm kind of throwing away some constraints and relaxing the problem. Uh, and then you can bring in ideas from duality and so forth. You get a high dimensional problem, but if you're very clever, uh, as Martin Wainwright is, you can show um, that the solution to this dual optimization problem can be re represented by a small variation on max product. So this equation looks a little common, but if you sort of Roll your eyes, it has a lot of the structure of the equation that I showed earlier. The only difference is now I'm taking messages and raising them to these powers. And these are numbers between 0 and 1 that damp the messages and they come from the sort of probabilities in these trees. What's nice about all this theory is that there are connections to linear programming relaxations of problems. And so I have a current solution to a problem and I also have this upper bound and as inference runs, Sometimes these two things will approach each other. 
And so there are cases in which even though you have this graph with many cycles where we know in general map inference is NP-hard, you sometimes get the globally optimal solution. So by doing this relaxed inference, sometimes the algorithm returns a certificate that says, for this particular problem instance, I know I found the global map, right? Because essentially you're you can check that your bound becomes tight. Um, and, uh, and so this has been a sort of workhorse in the discrete computer vision world. So for example, in stereo vision, where I have two images, and now your goal is to sort of like sort of find the, the sort of distance or disparity between pixels, which lets you estimate depths of points in the scene, right? So you're basically trying to say what's close and far from the camera. Uh, in a standard benchmark, they found that basically in about 90% of the test instances, 90% of test images, you actually could get the global map with this reweighted max product algorithm, which is pretty good. Because before that, there were a lot of kind of heuristic optimization algorithms and people didn't really know how good they were doing at optimizing. But, I, these standard algorithms you can only apply in cases where you have your variables are discrete and small in number. So we're going to fuse these ideas with our particle methods in which we're going to augment particles and now on our graph with cycles we're going to do this reweighted max product update and then select diverse. And so the optimization is going to look like this. You're going to basically, you have a current solution. You get new particles and then that gets me, you know, and then I run discrete optimization. As I run discrete optimization, I have my current guess over the particles and my upper bound. And those will go, and those will typically become tight. And then I get new new particles, and then I redo that thing. So you can think about you, these become tight on a higher plateau because your particles are getting better, and you do this many times. Okay. Okay. And so I'm going to skip uh, a little bit of the extra theory I had here, but um, you. Uh, you can apply all of the same greedy algorithms, they have the same properties. A nice thing too is that by minimizing errors and messages, I can provably show that this minimizes upper bounds in our max marginal distortions. So you can kind of show that this objective is minimizing precisely the thing you care about if you want to solve inference problems. All right, let's look at results instead. So here's some example examples. So these are, there's a video pose two data set, so this has bunch of uh, basically sequences clipped from TV shows where the true locations of people have been labeled so that you can use it for evaluation. In this case, this is from Friends, obviously. Um, and so in these plots, we're showing results of, with the same model, with the best model we could make, two inference algorithms. The sort of the light blue is the, is the TPMP, that's the more greedy <coughs> algorithm. And then the red is the DPMP, our diverse algorithm that spreads particles out. Um, and so sometimes they both work, but if you look at, uh, here, actually the next one has, has a better example. So here the top is the standard greedy algorithm, and the bottom uh, is our diverse algorithm. Watch what happens on, uh, on, that's on the right hand, so the arm that's to your left, his right arm. And you'll notice that sort of partway through the sequence, right, the greedy algorithm basically loses that arm completely, okay. whereas our algorithm at the bottom sort of tracks it throughout. Why does it lose it? It's because, you know, the model is, says, what do arms look like? They're things that are kind of flesh colored and have some edges. And right here, right, it basically partway through it mixes up the right and left arms. So it kind of thinks that he did like this and put his two arms on top of each other. And so it degenerates where it has all of its particles like this and it doesn't cover on the other hand, the diverse particle match product algorithm says, ah, well, I realize there's two modes. And I, because I do this optimization, I'll maintain particles this way and also particles this way. And it lets you get better robustness in your result. And uh, you can quantify that. So this is, again, accuracy. You could think of this as the fraction of, of, of frames in which you get a good result. You almost post it for various detection thresholds, various tolerances. And if we just focus on the left here, this is basically showing that um, the red versus light blue is the gain of performance you get by this diversity. And we also do well uh, you know, uh, compared to some competitive baselines from the literature, which are these uh, black and purple. All right. OK. So now, 
Actually, before I move on, are there any other questions on the pose estimation problem? How this is working? Uh, yeah. One quick question. When you try to detect the person, do you really need to specify the number of a person in the frame? So, in this case, here's the way to think about it. Our model is a single person model. And if you give it a sequence in which there are multiple people, the multiple people will be multiple modes of the posterior distribution, right? And so thus, we'll sort of implicitly get multiple people by sort of finding those multiple modes. Um, it's not an explicit multi-person model. You could do that, but that complicates other things in various ways. It's a good question. OK. So. Uh, so I want to switch gears, talk about another cool problem that uh, uh, is, is a big deal in, in, in science, although maybe many of you haven't heard much about it, and that's protein structure prediction. Yeah. So, right, so a protein is a sequence of, uh, of, um, tw of you know, 20 amino acids, and given the particular sequence you have, that protein will fold into an interesting three-dimensional structure, which has all sorts of implications for what its function is in a biological organism. And implicitly, if you know, if you just know this sequence and you know how physics works, you should be able to predict this 3D structure. But it turns out that's an enormously hard problem. Um, but if you could do well at it, do better at it, you could do all sorts of, all, there's all sorts of applications in medicine and so on. And a particular version of protein structure prediction is called sort of a simplified version that's still interesting is called side chain prediction and so proteins have a backbone this is kind of like the coarse structure and this is the thing that kind of bends and folds around and then also hanging off the, the backbone are these side chains and so this the you know the shape and structure of the side chain is different for each of the different amino acids and it's basically differences in the side chains that cause different proteins to do different things and you can think about the way these, these side chains kind of wave around by they have different continuous rotation angles that specify their locations in 3D. And so now side chain prediction is if I know the sort of coarse backbone structure, I want to predict where all these side chains are going to go. Okay. Okay. So the classic approach to doing this uh, uses a discretization. It's called a, they're called rotomers for reasons I won't go into, but it basically says that if you look at empirical distributions of where pro, you know, proteins tend to go, it turns out they tend to kind of fall at one of three angles. So there's kind of these three peaks that empirically most sort of side chains tend to go. And so basically you discretize by saying, well, they tend to be around one of these three points, and so I'm just going to assume that it has to be here, 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 three possibilities. So you get three discrete states, just to make the problem easier, okay? So this is a standard approach. It's not terrible, but it certainly doesn't capture everything. So here is an example of, this is showing all, if you, as you go through this Rotomer discretization, you get this finite set of possibilities, which is the red, and this is, green is showing the true structure, right? For some proteins, we have the true structure, for example, with X-ray crystallography. Um, and so that's great. We can use it to test our methods, but we still want computational methods because uh, X-ray crystallography is a very hard thing to do, right? To give you, to quantify it for a graduate student, it's often the case that someone will get their PhD thesis for determining the X-ray structure of a single protein. So six years of one person's life equals one protein structure. So that's a heavy burden. And, and so we care about proteins, so there are databases with tens of thousands of structures. But nevertheless, we'd like more automated method, methods for predicting structure. And so this is just showing that in this case, this is, a, this is a case where the true structure doesn't line up well. Okay, so why is this a graphical model, right? So again, so to give you another side chain prediction, you can think about saying that like this, this, and this is fixed, but all these little bits that are waving around, you don't know where they are. You have to figure out where they, where they want to go. And um, so this gives us a graphical model where the nodes, there's one node for each of the amino acids. And this, this, the, uh, the uh, state at that node um, is the set of basically side chain angles. OK? 
Okay? So this is between one and four continuous numbers, depending on which amino acid it is. And then now the edges come from the fact that if I fix the core structure of the model, then you know how do side chains interact? It's basically like attractive and repulsive energies. And once they get far enough apart, those energies are negligible and you can ignore them. So it's basically you have edges between any pair of amino acid whose physical distance is not too big. So you get a graph that's sparse. So right, and just to give you a sense, right, this is you know eight amino acids in this little picture. Real like uh, for real proteins, a small, a very small one would have a couple hundred amino acids, and we're interested in ones that have thousands. Okay. But so you have this graph that's sparse but has many cycles. The potentials uh, are sort of a com code a combination of statistical and physical knowledge. So they have these potentials, like I said, that say you tend to fold to certain side chains. That's a statistical measure. And there's also things that capture atomic interaction. So this is this axis is, is kind of the distance between uh, two uh, two atoms in the two two atoms in, of the two side chains. And roughly, I have this thing where if they're far enough apart, they don't interact. As they get closer, you get a sort of boost in probability. So it's higher probability or lower energy. So there's attractive forces that encourage things to fold. That's, of course, why proteins do anything useful. But then, uh, as you get too close, energy goes to infinity and probably goes to zero. Which basically, why does that happen? Basically, two electrons can't occupy the same space at the same time. So it gives you actually a model that's kind of hard to do inference on, because you have all these points in which it's just, just in the same way if I'm waving my arms around when they hit, that's a point that I can't move. You have the same thing going on with these things. You get all these kind of hard clashes, and that makes, if you just do like gradient-based continuous optimization, it's just hopelessly bad. Okay. So, but we can apply the exact same inference algorithm I talked about before in the vision problems to this problem off the shelf. No changes to any of that code. Just with a different definition of the potential function. We're now, so I have a set of particles which are guesses at the location of the side chain. I sample more. I have this graph with cycles in which I do that reweighted max product update. So, so there's cycles just like there was in the pose tracking, but I can do it. And then I do I diverse selection and continue. And you get the same kind of thing where you sort of push up probabilities in the continuous space over time. Um, so. Our energy is going to come from Rosetta. This is an enormous open source software package produced by biochemists that has a huge number of contributions. If anyone's ever heard of this folded game, uh, so this was a video game that was created where people basically tried to fold proteins. Where folded came from is the folks who do Rosetta, their standard algorithm doing optimization were basically simulated annealing with fancy proposals. It's terrible works really badly. So they said, we can't figure out how to optimize this thing. Let's see if we can get people to do the work for us. And so they made a video game where they could do it. So if you've heard about that, it's a cool thing. We are using exactly the same energy function that went into that. So we're trying to make algorithms that can optimize that thing that the people were trying to optimize. And so we're going to replace, we're using their black box energy. What's nice is because I should say the code to this thing, um, I don't know, to be generous, it's intimidating. Um, but the nice thing is we don't have to know exactly what's going on. We just kind of can use it as a black box that say, here's some current guesses, tell me their energies or probabilities, and then we, that's all we need for our code to run. Um, and this, here's to give you some examples. This is over iterations. Um, this is uh, probabilities. So this is, there's two things here. This is, for 20 proteins, we did many runs, so we have confidence bars over how often you get various solutions. Uh, and then for a data set of 370 proteins, a bigger one, we did one run on each. The, here's log probability higher is better. The purple is this baseline of a tuned method for that Rosetta algorithm. And then here we're showing pretty substantial gains from doing our optimization. So the black is our diverse optimization. The, the light blue is a, more, is a more greedy method that sometimes does well, but sometimes does worse, as you can see from this confidence bars. We can also, that for some of the, for the particular set of 370 proteins we pick, we carefully pick ones in which there is a ground truth or close to ground truth structure that comes from X-ray crystallography. And so we can look at um, uh, how close we're getting uh, 
to the, the crystal structures. This, so this is RMSD, root mean square deviation, in angstroms. And uh, you can see that this horizontal line is, again, the standard approach. If you take our model and do greedy inference, you actually do a bit worse. But if you instead do uh, this smart diverse inference, you do substantially better. And what's interesting is that this is the, your best prediction under the model. But now if you say, well, let me consider two or three or four top predictions and say, are any of those two or three or four top predictions close to the model? And you can see you very, yes, actually, they're substantially better. So this says, even in cases where maybe the model is a little wrong and you don't have the best top prediction, you do pretty well in one of your secondary modes. And we find these secondary modes with the diverse algorithm. That's why this curve goes down. The greedy algorithms do not. That's why these curves are almost flat. Um, to give you a sense, here's, uh, here's again a case where, um, so this gray mesh is the electron cloud density, so that's kind of the areas that are of high probability. The green is the true structure from X-ray crystallography. And then here the black is our estimate, which you can see is very close, whereas things that like the red or the purple, those are sort of more standard methods, are quite far away. And so we also get a set of particles scattered around it. Uh, here's an example of looking at a sort of larger, a little bit larger protein you're running on. Um, and here is uh, the true structure. Here is the predictions of a greedy algorithm. And so at first, if you kind of look at this at first, you say, oh, well, I don't know, you know, it's got a lot of things that look similar. Maybe that's pretty good. And it looks pretty confident in its predictions. Uh, but now if I zoom in on this little bit, so this bottom is zooming in, you can see that, yes, it has a bunch of confident predictions but sometimes they're just totally wrong. So as an example, if you look in these squares, it has a confident prediction over, over where it thinks that side chain is that basically is just completely different from the ground truth. If I instead run the diverse algorithm, you get this kind of result, where it's finding the top modes, but also finding secondary modes. And so like if you look over here, you look at this part of ground truth, yes, it discovers that, well, you know, there's that configuration as well as another one that are both favored for the model, right? And so there's true uncertainty, right? So a lot of, in, in proteins, there's a lot of uh, sort of, for example, disease is related to there being two different ways a protein can fold. And if a protein folds the wrong way, it has bad implications. And so that's why in this space, capturing uncertainty is, is very important. Um, and, so, and so it's nice to know sort of which parts are constrained and not, and we, our algorithm has that hope of actually capturing that. Um, so, so to summarize, we have this particle-based inference algorithm that applies to a, a very broad range of, of continuous graphical models, and we've validated it in, in several of these applications. And for me, what's nice is that a couple things have come together in this work. One is that it has broad applicability. We have some General, general purpose code online you can download that basically just says, as long as we can evaluate your energies, you can run it. And so you get all the benefits of this diverse selection. And it's something that, uh, unlike many sort of stochastic selection methods, uh, requires less tuning. Uh, so it gives you sort of rigorous, non-asymptotic bounds on accuracy from that diverse. And so it's nice to have the theory, and that theory does really translate to a better performance in practice. Uh, so thank you. Questions? Yes, please. Uh, uh, I was just wondering uh, whether how, how would the idea of Markov random field would work in this case? So these models are Markov random fields. So they're Markov random fields. So the Markovianity comes from the graph structure. So to give, like, if I look here, uh, uh, for the protein problem, it is Markov with respect to this graph. But it's a Markov random field in which, you know, uh, almost all, if you take any class or reading tutorial on Markov random fields, the vast majority of the literature is talking about r random fields in which the variables are discrete. And I think the reason for that, or, or fields in which the variables are jointly Gaussian. And I think the reason for that is that in the continuous non-Gaussian case, the algorithms we have to do inference in the Markov random fields have traditionally been um, I have worked in space a long time, so I think I can say most of the algorithms are just terrible. They're, they're, kind of, they're kind of useless in practice. And so here, we're really trying to make an effort to, to get something that would actually work for a broad range of continuous Markov random fields, so that maybe that can become 
a more practical modeling tool in, in computer vision and the sciences and so on and so forth. Yeah. So is there ground truth? Uh, is the two map solution or it's like a, a true like a protein structure? So I'm not sure whether there's any like mismatch between them. Well, there is potentially some mismatch. Yeah, so we're, we're, we are finding map of these, these models. Mm -hmm. And I think for some of these proteins, it's, it's pretty sh we're pretty sure we have the true, close to the very tropes of the true continuous map. Um, but the, uh, you note know that our map has this error from the true structure. And when you take more particles, that goes down. Now, there's two reasons for this, right? So uh, one reason for this is, in fact, that there is actually no single true structure for proteins. So for s when proteins fold, there will actually be some amino acids, some side chains who are highly constrained, so they're at one point. But there's actually will be other ones that maybe are on the edges of the protein that can kind of wave around. You think about they're not very constrained. And so when you do the crystallography, you might say, um, uh, I think it's here, but in fact, it could also be there too. And so there's some errors you're going to get from that fact. But also, some of these errors are due to weaknesses of the model. From my perspective, for if you're someone who cares about modeling, like a biochemist in this case, if your inference algorithm is terrible, it doesn't sort of reliably find the map, then it's hard to build models. Because you run it, and you get a bad result. And then you say, well, why is my result bad? Is my model bad, or is it because inference failed? Um, uh, and um, so we're trying to sort of say, if you get a bad result with this kind of algorithm, well, the, the inference is pretty good, so it means your model's bad. And now you can look at it and figure out how to improve your model. So this was actually a big deal. I mentioned that we weighted max product on stereo vision. So in the world of discrete Markov random fields and computer vision, there was this kind of like huge change from, from things that the way these were done in the 1990s to the way they were done in the 2000s. Because we basically got inference algorithms that went from being sort of heuristic local optimization to provably global optimality. And so suddenly the models got much, much better because we actually had inference algorithms that worked. And so I'm hoping, I would love it, if there was a kind of similar change that could happen for more continuous models. Did that answer? Yeah, cool. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, so let's thank our speaker again.